This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 758, recorded on May 20, 2021. I'm Vincent Rackenyellow, and you are listening to to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Daniel, this is clinical update number 63. How will we know when the pandemic's <gasps> over, Daniel? Um, actually, that's a, that's a great question. When will it shift from being a pandemic to just, hey, there's still... COVID-19 around and, and, you know, it's, it's become less of a pandemic and maybe Vincent, maybe you're the person to answer that question. Cause what was, uh, what was the point when polio ceased to be a pandemic and, uh, started to be just something we were trying to get rid of? Well, polio was around before we had this word pandemic. So we never, <laughs> we never got to call it a pandemic, but, but Daniel, would you say we're still in the middle of an HIV AIDS pandemic? Yeah, yeah, and I try to make that point. Um, you know, I, I've been offered a, a couple of people have reached out and said, "Oh, you know, would you like to write a book?" You know, and I and I am working on a book um, that Chuck Knirsch connected me with about, you know, sort of a what happened with the with the vaccines and and what was the rollout like. But the whole idea about writing a book about, oh, we've survived the pandemic, or I have no other people have written these books. And, and it reminded me of a movie, and it was uh, Surviving the Pandemic, and it was about HIV. And, and I remember talking to my buddy, uh, Joe McGowan, and I was like, I, I don't understand. It's not over. Um, there are th over 30 million people infected with HIV. Um, we see another 50,000 new infections every year in the U.S. We see, you know, half a million to a million people every year dying of HIV. Uh, explain to me how we're not still in the midst of that pandemic. That's right. Um, so, yeah. No, well, very Daniel, sorry. before you start, what's uh, on your bow tie today? You know, it kind of looks like a coronavirus, doesn't it? Yeah, it's very Even nice. The virus with the little coronas there, so. All right. Yeah, I, our listeners may may not know this, but um, just about every one of my bow ties is an infectious disease. And whenever I appear <laughs> on Friday, it's always a sexually transmitted infectious disease. So, and um, when you can, when you take care of patients, uh, do you wear these infectious bow ties? <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> Very good. Um, and I, I, you know, I started doing it in part as a teaching thing for mm -hmm. the residents, medical students. So that was always, uh, I actually, my socks match. I won't show those now, um, but they match the pathogen. So maybe I'm wearing like one with little red snappers. So they're supposed to cue them that it's tuberculosis. I have an yes. anthrax. I have several others. Great. So. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's jump right in. Um, with my quotation, we are drowning in information, but starved for knowledge. Um, and that's by John Nesbitt. Um, and I think this is so relevant because it's really this fire hose of information. Um, you know, we're seeing it all around COVID, but this is just the, the modern world. And we're always struggling to make sense of what, what is all this information mean? How do, how do we actually get from information to knowledge? So uh, hopefully we, we play a part in doing that. Uh, let me start with the updates. How, how are things? Things are really much better here in the U.S., um, here in New York. Uh, one of our local hospitals I discharged, who I think is, at least for the moment, this will be uh, no COVID patients left in the hospital after this gentleman goes home. He's probably home already with his wife and twins. So that's uh, very exciting. Um, other big hospitals in area down to single digit numbers of COVID cases. Uh, my partner in New Jersey just admitted someone today with COVID. And as you can imagine, uh, this is a woman who did not get her vaccine, you know, diabetic who, you know, really should uh, have been taking that opportunity. So that's, that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing um, younger individuals. We're seeing people who did not take the opportunity to get vaccinated. Um, but the numbers really, you know, exponentially seem to be going down. I continue to have that optimism um, that we're going to be in a really great place across the country in July. There certainly are areas with poor vaccine uptake. And, you know, you worry about those um, areas starting to see a rise when people get back indoors, either because it got so gosh darn hot, they're in for air conditioning, or when it gets cold again and people are in indoors for the warmth. 
um, around the world, right? Um, sort of parallel with the HIV, we are in no way at the end of this pandemic. And until we are more generous, until we're able to get everyone in the world vaccinated, um, we are not safe. I was joking today about first world problems where people complain about their chairs not as comfortable as they would like. There's plenty of places in the world without chairs, right? Um, and I think that's the, um, the vaccine um, story at this point. Um, I will say as we get into this, um, we certainly have evolving recommendations, have people's heads a little bit spinning, um, but that's actually what we wanted. We wanted to learn. Um, we are not where we were a year ago. A year ago, we did not know much. We actually know a tremendous amount now. And as we learn more, as the science comes in, um, then we can actually revise what, what people are being uh, told to do, uh, what we know is safe, what we know is not safe. So we'll go through that. Um, but I'm going to start with my children and COVID. You know, this is always the crowd pleaser or not. Um, Paul Offit appeared on the podcast Track the Vax with Serena Marshall. Uh, that's another one of the podcasts that I enjoy listening to. I actually was on, I was a guest on um, the 13th episode of Track the Vax. And Serena's wonderful. I, you know, I, I, I miss that it wasn't as raw, I think, as uh, Twiv is, because at one point uh, she asked me a question and I replied and she just started laughing to the point where she had to actually stop the recording and she edited that out. I thought that was great, but um, not all my jokes are bad. Um, so <laughs> this episode with Paul Offit um, was the May 8th, 18th episode. I'm giving a little plug for them um, called Next Up in Line for COVID uh, Vaccines Kids. Um, and uh, it was really a great, um, great discussion between Serena and Paul. And uh, Paul Offit brought up the fact um, really that I try to reinforce on a regular basis that, yes, um, kids are actually at some risk. It's not huge. It certainly is lower. Um, but the reason we're recommending vaccination to adolescents at this point is not for the greater good. It's actually to protect them. It's like putting a seatbelt on them, putting a helmet on them. Um, and, you know, let me quote Paul Offit, what he said during that discussion. Uh, you have at least 300 children who've died from this infection and estimates are it could be as high as 500. He's talking about just right here in the United States. Um, he also pointed out that we did a really great job, I like to reinforce this, initially of protecting our children early in the pandemic with only 2.4% of those total infections in the early months being in children. Um, now things are changing. Now children account for 24% of the infections. My colleagues, as I mentioned, are admitting adolescents to ICUs. A uh, number of uh, articles and releases about the, the shift into younger ages. Um, I'm also going to add here that per the CDC, the number of confirmed multisystem inflammatory syndrome cases in children, so that's that Miss C, um, is approaching 4,000. And there are many more that are still under investigation, including about 500 just right here in New York State. I don't want to blow that out of proportion because I like to say children are at low risk. They're not at no risk, but there are things we can do to keep these kids safe. Um, it has been really difficult for a lot of these children, actually, I will say for us parents, um, to have schools closed, to have a lot of these other social and other opportunities closed. But there was another MMWR publication, um, hot off the press today as we're recording this, Characteristics of COVID-19 Cases and Outbreaks at Child Care Facilities, District of Columbia, July through December 2020. Um, and here the authors were reporting on 469 child care facilities in the District of Columbia. Um, as far as facility-associated outbreaks, they occurred in 5.8% of the facilities. Um, the other flip of that is uh, you could say over 94% of the facilities had no outbreaks. Um, the child care facilities in D.C. were able to adhere to many of the recommended prevention measures um, and reporting requirements. Um, and basically, they did a good job. The kids were able to be in these settings and they reserved, they reported that really similar to what had been observed in other studies. The rise in the COVID-19 cases and outbreaks um, correlated with level of community spread. Um, so I think that's really a positive message here. We can get these kids out in these settings. We can do it safely. We've learned how to do that. We now have the lowest positive test um, rates across this country 
actually ever, right? Early on when we started testing, I remember in New York, like 80% of the tests were coming back positive. Um, <clears throat> a recent article that I tweeted out, I should tell people, just follow my Twitter um, at Daniel Griffin MD because I try to get a lot of these um, articles out there, um, but really showing how a lack of testing plagued us early on. Now we are doing a lot of testing and you know you're doing enough testing or you know you're doing a lot of testing when you're getting a positivity rate of down in the one or two percent nationally. So um, really going in the right direction here for improving uh, the risk for our children. Um, I should probably tell this story here. I, I always try to be careful when I talk about risk and I talk about no risk. Uh, my wife asked me yesterday, she was going to give Barnaby uh, a sandwich uh, with Swiss cheese, turkey, and mayo. And it had been an you know, insulated thing and there was a blue ice thing in there, but now the blue ice thing was no longer cold. So she wanted to know if it was still okay for Barnaby to put in a new blue ice pack. And it, uh, I had not taken off my work hat. Uh, so I said, oh, that seems like a very low risk decision going ahead and letting him have that. My wife's response was, I don't want a low risk. I want no risk for our son Barnaby. <laughs> I was like, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> we can eat that sandwich. He will be fine. Uh, so we, I know we want absolutes, but even when it comes to sandwiches, we don't have absolutes. All right. Pre-exposure transmission. On Friday, May 14th, the article Interim Estimates of Vaccine Effectiveness of Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna COVID-19 Vaccines Among Healthcare Personnel, 33 U.S. sites, January through March 2021, right? So this is, this is hot off the press. This became available as an early release. And on the last TWIV clinical update, uh, Vincent had asked mainly to address questions from our audience about how we knew about safety and efficacy of vaccines beyond the initial large RCTs, right? We were talking about uh, the latest adolescent trial. There's only 2,000 people in there, but what are they doing over time? So um, I brought up theirs, um, but here, this is one of these um, trials that continues to give us information after those RCTs. So here the authors report on a case control study of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine efficacy, VE, with HCP healthcare personnel being enrolled at these 33 sites across the United States. Um, so these were healthcare personnel with the potential for exposure to SARS-CoV-2 through direct patient contact um, or for you know indirect exposure. Um, so think about these are these are people who are exposed, right? So you're, you're getting an exposure here. They had uh, they had case patients, they had control participants, um, and these were being identified for, through routine employee testing performed on site um, through their occupational health practices. They went ahead and the healthcare personnel with a positive SARS-CoV-2 PCR or antigen-based test result and at least one COVID-19-like illness um, were enrolled as the cases. Um, and then we had the, um, the negatives being those who did not have a PCR. Um, you know, it didn't matter if these people had symptoms, right? If they had something else going on, as long as they did not have COVID. Um, and as of March 18th, 2021, 623 case patients, 1,220 controls were enrolled, um, and they gave us an effectiveness estimate um, of a complete two-dose regimen of these vaccines uh, at 94%, which is really actually consistent with the clinical trials. Um, and I should say surprising, right? We were not expecting, you know, the real world is usually uh, not as good as what we see. Um, but what, what are the limitations here? So first, um, testing for SARS-CoV-2 infection among healthcare um, providers was based on occupational health practices at each facility. Um, and, you know, vaccinated people may have actually been less likely to go for testing, possibly underestimating the efficacy. They, you know, thinking, hey, I've been vaccinated. I'm not as worried about a little bit of sniffles here. So that, that is one issue. Uh, and the authors comment on this as well. Um, second, again, limited sample size. You know, we, we love our 10s, our 20s, our 30,000. So this was not as big a sample size. Um, and third, right, it's not clear that you can um, generalize this to the entire U.S. population, right? So different races, different um, ethnic groups, uh, age, right? And we've certainly uh, started to get a sense that the vaccine has different efficacy based upon age. Good data starting to support that. And fourth, uh, the healthcare personnel with a known 
past SARS-CoV-2 infection were excluded, right? We're, we're vaccinating those individuals, giving them protection. Uh, so again, are those people going to get better or worse protection than people who did not have that exposure prior to vaccination? We think that they may actually be even more protected. So that 94%, another reason why maybe even underestimation. So now this was actually um, the data that came out the day after our last TWIV and the headline uh, making comments by the current CDC director about vaccines and masking. So um, I certainly have gotten a lot of questions. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing that sort of in this context. So what, what, what was that all about? So I think there were several points uh, that that was based on. And I think the CDC director has been really clear that the recommendations were science driven. Um, and what is that science? Well, one of the bits of science that has just been building, and this was another, um, another brick in that wall, is that vaccines can be incredibly powerful at protecting a vaccinated person. Right. So the person vaccinated, um, as long as they have an intact immune system, as long as they can mount a response, they can have a tremendous amount of infection. I will be talking about people that can't get that. Um, <clears throat> the second, and this... Um, I think is an important point, um, growing evidence that an asymptomatic vaccinated person is at very low risk for transmitting to others, right? Incredibly low chance that they're even going to turn PCR positive. And then we have data suggesting that if they're asymptomatic and PCR positive, that is at such a low level that it may actually be below level of transmission. So that was the second part. What are the other caveats I think that need to be put into this whole situation? 4% of people in the U.S. have impaired immune systems due to disease or medications. So that's about 10 million people that are unable to protect themselves with active vaccination, right? So they are relying on the kindness, the kindness, um, the decision to get vaccinated, the masking, um, the non-pharmaceutical and the vaccine uh, mitigation measures. The other is what about children 11 and under who do not have access to the vaccination and the protection that uh, this could offer? That's another 50 million people here, right, who are at risk if someone is unvaccinated, infected with SARS-CoV-2 and walking around. Um, the other point that people are bringing up and I think is relevant is children 12 to 15 just got access. So millions of these kids who have not had time to get that second shot, not had time to get to that full protection. Um, and so many, many, rightfully so, in the, in the U.S. worry that unvaccinated people will be dishonest um, and take their masks off around vulnerable people and infect um, them, giving them COVID. So um, I think uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, the only state that I'm aware of with any sort of a, um, a real robust verification system is New York here with our... Um, our Excelsior Pass, uh, which is already already being uh, used and already planned for use for sporting events to verify that you get to sit in that vaccinated section, et cetera. So um, remember, the CDC is not the police. Uh, they are a public health um, agency. And this is the science, um, you know, the policing, that's going to be someone else's job. Now, one of the things that comes up in this context is people who say, well, I don't know if I need to get a vaccine because I, I already had the COVID. Um, I, I should be fine. So what about that? How much protection against reinfection do you get with prior infection? And, and boy, have we come far in a year, right? A year ago, there was the whole discussion, is reinfection even a thing? Well, I think we've moved past that. And now really the question is, at what rate are we seeing this? If you've been infected, what percent does that protect you relative to vaccination, for instance. Um, and I've always been shocked that there's a group of people out there who would, who would somehow prefer um, natural infection to a vaccine. Um, you know, I, I'm seeing a, a lady um, now who got chicken pox, right, instead of a vaccine. Um, and she has this recurrent zoster all over her face. She actually has to wear a mask. Um, she keeps having issues trying to get uh, employment because at job interviews, uh, this is an issue. Polio, right? I think Vincent, right up your alley. Uh, if you could get a polio vaccine or just take that chance of maybe a little bit of paralysis for the rest of your life, uh, always shocked here. But here's some data. Um, and this was the study risk of SARS CoV 2 reinfection in a university student population uh, published in CID, Clinical Infectious Disease. And they reported on a retrospective analysis of 2,021 students with prior infection um, and 14,080 students without previous infection. 
Um, so these were age 17 to 24, and they reported an 84% lower risk of infection compared to the unvaccinated students over a study period of four months. Uh, so I just wanna give a comparator here. Remember, this is an age group with almost 100% protection with vaccination, and here only an 84% reduction with prior infection. And this is just in that window, just the four months. Um, so my takeaway here is, you know, we saw dozens of reinfections um, in these young adults in this short period. Uh, prior infection is not vaccination testing, never miss an opportunity to test. We are back into the realm, I want to remind everyone of the indeterminate test. We now have rates that are dropping back so low that we are back to those issues of what is the positive predictive value and what is the negative predictive value of a test. I don't know if our listeners remember that far back, but I'm glad that we're circling back to there. Um, this is the situation where I'll, I'll start with sort of the high numbers. Back when we had a disease prevalence of 30 30%. Um, if you used a test that was 80% sensitive, 99% specific, right? We're thinking of like PCR, um, some of our antigen tests here. Um, if a person had a positive test, 97% of the time that was truly positive. Only 3% of the time was that false. Um, if it was negative, your negative predictive value is up in the 90s as well. But what happens when we drop to where we are now? What if the disease prevalence is down at 1%? using that same test. If it's negative, okay, it is negative with even higher certainty than we had to begin with. But what if it is positive? The false positive rate now is gonna exceed 50%. It's gonna be at 55%. Um, so now it's becoming really important at a lot of our testing sites to have that second test ready to go. So if you get a positive, or what I will say, an indeterminate initial result, you wanna be ready to, to employ a second test to determine if that's really a true positive. Um, and this is also gonna be a little bit of communication with each state's Department of Health. Do they want that indeterminate reported? How are you allowed to respond? All right, active vaccination, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Um, and I will call this, perhaps patience is a good thing. Um, and so we saw the preprint results of a study looking at extended interval boosting of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine entitled Extended Interval BNT162B2 vaccination enhances peak antibody generation in older people. And can you guess what they saw? Well, yes, this is the secret of a well-crafted title. It's all right there. Um, the authors reported on 175 people over the age of 80 and found a peak antibody response that was 3.5 fold higher with an extended interval of 11 to 12 weeks versus the standard three weeks, right? So 3.5 times higher by just waiting that extra point. Um, <clears throat> and I think this makes sense, right? We did our studies at three weeks, at four weeks, um, you know, because as I tell my daughter, Eloise, 95% is good enough. We don't need 98. Um, you know, these older individuals where maybe we don't have as robust responses we might like, um, also start thinking about those people with immunocompromise where there were issues. Um, maybe an extended interval, even we'll talk in the future about some of these heterologous or mix and match uh, boosting approaches. Mm -hmm. um, for a population, we may be getting where we need to be, right? Because um, I think it was quoted on the last TWIV, a little bit of discussion there with Kathy and, uh, and Alan and Rich and the gang about if someone gets vaccinated, we're only seeing your chance of dying only, and I think I'm going to use the word only here, is one in 500,000 people. And that includes all these people who come back with a negative antibody test, come back with a low titer antibody uh, test after vaccines. The vaccines are incredibly effective. I don't know if we need 3.5 higher, but at least it says that if there is a weight, depending on your vaccination strategy, um, you're not getting lower antibodies, you're actually getting significantly higher. Three, the period of detectable viral replication, the viral symptom phase, as I like to say, the time for monitoring and monoclonals. And remember, NSAIDs are fine for symptom relief. Um, I'm gonna sort of combine pull in passive vaccination and the early inflammatory phase here together. And part of it, I'm gonna bring up the issue that timing matters. So what, what, what am I talking about here? So we finally saw the peer reviewed results of the recovery trial 
uh, results on convalescent plasma in patients admitted to hospital in the Lancet. Um, so as people may know, I, I feel like that's a little bit late, right? We're waiting until the early inflammatory phase. We're not getting convalescent plasma in um, during that first week. Well, let's see what we saw here. Um, the title was Convalescent Plasma in Patients Admitted to Hospital with COVID-19 Recovery, a Randomized Controlled Open Label Platform Trial. Um, and at this point, our listeners are perhaps familiar with the recovery trial out of the UK. Um, and just what, are, what do those letters stand for? This is a Randomized Controlled Open Label Platform Trial, Randomized Evaluation of COVID-19 therapy, um, looking really at several possible treatments in patients with COVID-19 in the UK. The trial is still underway at 177 NHS hospitals from across the UK. Um, and this is the trial that introduced steroids um, at the right time in the right patient um, at the right dose as the standard of care. Um, we also got some uh, some significant results from recovery on the, um, the potential harm and lack of benefit of HCQ, um, and most recently, the compelling data demonstrating um, the mortality benefits and other benefits of adding tocilizumab to steroids for the treatment of COVID at the right time in the right patient. Um, and this paper uh, describes the results of patients who are randomly assigned one-to-one -to, -one to receive either usual care or usual care plus high titer convalescent plasma. Um, the primary outcome was 28-day mortality, um, and it was analyzed on an intent-to-treat basis. So between May 28, 2020 and January 15, 2021, 11,558 um, individuals were assigned to either the convalescent plasma group or the usual care group. And what did they find? Um, they reported no significant difference in 28-day mortality between the two groups, 24% versus 24%. The 28-day mortality rate was similar in all pre-specified subgroups of patients. Um, no significant effect on the proportion of patients discharged from the hospital within 28 days. Again, 66% in the convalescent plasma, 66% in the usual care. Um, among those not on invasive mechanical ventilation at randomization, Again, no significant difference in the proportion of patients meeting the composite endpoint of progression to invasive mechanical ventilation or death. Um, so, so in summary, this was a robust, well-powered study using high titer convalescent plasma early after admission, right? So they were getting it in within, it was a median of two days after admission. Um, no benefit was observed. Um, if anything, there was, I feel like I'm quoting uh, Mark Chrislap, a non-statistically significant trend toward a 20% higher rate of mechanical ventilation if you look closely at figure two. So uh, that means that, yeah, there was a trend there, but they did not actually find um, benefit anywhere. There was a little bit of a suggestion that maybe if you had a larger study, you would have started to see harm, actually. Um, they, did a, they also did a meta-analysis of the 10 major trials to date. And I will say here, again, the totality of data putting all these trials together did not support a benefit to convalescent plasma for hospitalized patients. Um, now, the authors did comment that recovery only included patients admitted to hospital. Um, so this trial doesn't really address whether or not there's maybe a narrow window early in disease where convalescent plasma might um, provide some benefit. Um, and that question um, has not yet been robustly tested in a um, sufficiently large randomized controlled trial. Um, and they actually did reference a trial that we've discussed uh, here, which was the New England Journal trial. This was early high titer plasma therapy to prevent severe COVID-19 in older adults. Um, and that was that small study with 80 patients um, in a geriatric unit in Argentina who got plasma within 72 hours. Um, and there, there was a report of some benefit on disease progression. Um, so just sort of putting, I will say, the hospitalized patients, really robust data from this trial, as well as a meta-analysis of 10 other trials, um, 
really a labor intensive approach and we're not seeing uh, data here to support it. But is there something that's sort of similar um, that can be given during that first seven to 10 days? What about those monoclonal cocktails? Uh, so we got another press release. This was actually uh, presented at a conference, but what, what was the press release? This was from Regeneron. Um, phase three data that was also presented at the American Thoracic Society 2021 uh, meeting. Regen Cove, so this is the casarivimab with him. Devimab, reduced risk of hospitalization or death by 70% in non-hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So this was a phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial um, evaluating the Regeneron cocktail in 4,567 high-risk patients with COVID-19. Um, and they studied two doses, right? The currently authorized 2,400 milligram dose and a 1,200 milligram dose, so half the dose. Um, and they evaluated all these patients for efficacy. Um, they all had one of the risk factors, right, to include them in this study. And the Regeneron Cove cocktail met its primary and all secondary endpoints with similar efficacy for both doses. Um, so, and they saw this for 1200 milligrams or 2400 milligrams. So 70% and 71% reduced risk of hospitalization or death through day 29 compared to placebo for both doses, a four day shorter time to symptom resolution and reduced viral load. Um, and that had a p-value of 0 0.0001 for both. Uh, great safety data. Um, as mentioned, there's are thousands of um, individuals. One person had an anaphylactic reaction that resolved with therapy. Uh, a little bit more on monoclonals. This is again another exciting week. Um, updated and expanded emergency use authorization for the monoclonal cocktails. Now including more medical conditions and the BMI has been dropped down to only being greater than 25. So uh, just to give a sense of what that means. So for a man who is my height, five foot 10, I would only need to weigh 175 pounds or more um, to be allowed to squeeze in under BMI alone. Uh, so this is really expanding down to many of us, except maybe those really fit athletic people like my son, Barnaby, who keeps getting new personal records in the mile. Um, but we also had, and I think this is critical too, updated info on efficacy relative to different variants, right? So this is, this is what worries me about the variants is the impact on monoclonal therapy. So in these new um, updated FDA EUA documents, uh, there are a couple tables. <clears throat> There's a table looking at uh, the variant substitutions and their impact on the Eli Lilly cocktail. Um, with the B117, um, no change um, in susceptibility. But when we get into the B1351, originally described in South Africa, um, we are seeing a 215-fold reduction in susceptibility. When we look at the P1, say originally described in Brazil, um, we are seeing greater than 46. Remember, both of these have very similar um, key substitutions. So the K417N or T, the E484K, and the N501Y. Um, and then the B1427 and the B1429, originally described in California, that have the L452R, about a ninefold reduction. And the B1526, that's New York City's, um, that also has the E44K, that's about a 31-fold reduction in susceptibility. So in contrast, the Regeneron cocktail uh, did not show any fold reduction in susceptibility for any of these key substitutions um, or for any of these variants. So it now becomes, I'll say, pretty critical when you're deciding which monoclonal cocktail to use to have a sense of what variants are prevalent in your area um, because you may be having um, reduced benefit to your therapy if you're giving it to a patient who has one of these key substitutions. Still in this section, remember, this is that early inflammatory phase. So if those oxygen saturations drop below 94, that's when we have data that steroids, dexamethasone, six milligrams a day for 10 days improves outcomes, um, is associated with a mortality benefit. Um, be careful with higher or longer doses. 
Um, remdesivir, minor impact at huge expense. Um, still recommending anticoagulation for our hospitalized patients. Um, at least prophylactic dose is associated with improved outcomes, mortality benefit. We still really need better studies in this uh, space. Um, oxygen and pulmonary support, as we're seeing in India, so critical to have that ability to deliver oxygen. Um, antibiotics, not helpful for treating viral infections and can be harmful. Um, as we mentioned, tocilizumab can be added to steroids in a certain subset of patients, um, appears to have a mortality benefit if used appropriately early in patients not responding to steroids. And all right, we're going to get into our tail phase of our discussion, our long COVID part. Um, we have finally, you know, I have the paper, I guess say finally, because this was preprint. Now it's uh, published in BMJ. Uh, I spent some time going through this. The paper is risk of clinical sequelae after the acute phase of SARS-CoV-2 infection retrospective cohort study. And this was in the BMJ. Um, and this was generated really from a huge data set of 266,586 individuals with SARS-CoV-2 infection aged 18 to 65. So I sort of encourage you, we're looking at a younger group of patients here than some of the other studies. Um, and at minimum, right, I'm hoping Vincent will post this on Parasites Without Borders for people to link into, but I encourage listeners to go there and to at minimum look at figure two in this paper. Um, there's a few takeaways from this paper. Um, one of them is that 14% percent of adults aged less than or equal to 65 who were infected with SARS-CoV-2 had at least one new type of clinical sequelae that required medical care after the acute phase of the illness, right? So we're seeing about 14% here um, in the under 65. Um, the people at higher risk were those people that had been um, in the hospital. Uh, just a shout out to some of the authors. Um, actually, a couple of these authors are friends of mine. I work with them uh, at United Health Group. Sarah Dari, we've been working on a uh, bunch of long COVID um, stuff. And Ken Cohen, we published a paper a little while back together. Um, but let's just hit a little bit about why am I telling you to look at figure two? Um, one of the really difficult things is that people who get um, acute COVID um, can end up with a number of other clinical sequelae at significantly higher levels. And what, what are those? Um, not surprising, interstitial lung disease, the ha hazard ratio for that is greater than 7.5. Um, this is really troubling. And I know I come back to this a lot, but encephalopathy, um, this is about a hazard ratio of greater than six. Um, and this is really difficult. You see a lot of really high functioning individuals who now are having difficulty um, on so many levels and, and actually being, you know, being told, oh, it's all in your head, et cetera. Well, I guess it's all inside the, inside the uh, skull. Yes, it is uh, damage um, and impact on the brain. We're also seeing um, cardiomyopathy, um, and that's about three has a ratio of about three. We're seeing heart failure. We're seeing arrhythmias. We're seeing memory difficulty, amnesia. We're seeing these people being more than twice as likely to develop a stroke. Uh, peripheral neuropathies, a lot of these are small fiber issues affecting gut motility and other things. So really a, a, a tough space and, and a lot of people are trying to jump in and understand and we're looking forward to the CDC guidance on this. Um, and I guess I should say, we're still waiting for that really good data on people with long COVID and the impact of vaccines. So um, I'll say a friend and colleague of mine, Akiko um, Iwasaki up at Yale. She used to actually come on Fridays to our uh, Steve Goff uh, weekly lab meetings. Uh, so I got to know her then. And she has a long COVID study. So people can just email COVID recovery at yale.edu. If you have long COVID and you're thinking about getting a vaccine, uh, that's a great way to connect. And then we can start getting some really good data. We continue to see this. I say anecdotally, which, you know, the plural of anecdote is not data, it's anecdotes. Um, and so we really want to get this um, quantified. We want to get a sense of who gets better, the timing, et cetera. So all right, I'm going to close there and I'm going to say thank you everyone for your incredibly generous support going to Parasites Without Borders and helping us support FEMRIC and all the great work Foundation International Medical Relief of Children um, continues to do throughout the world. These are tough times and no one's safe until everyone is safe. Time for some questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. 
Patricia writes, one topic I have not seen anywhere is drug metabolism. I seem to be a poor metabolizer of drugs. I've been like this my life. Even Asper cream can put me to sleep. NyQuil, I'm out for 24 hours. These are just two examples. At age 58, I feel getting vaccinated is important, but I don't dare try because of how I always react to drugs. If I can handle any, it's a child's dosage at best. Can you point me to more info on this? I can't seem to find any discussion on this topic as it relates to vaccine. Or if you know the answer to whether it would be safe for me to get vaccinated, that would be helpful too. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to encourage you to get vaccinated first off, but what, let me explain what I know. So usually I tell people, oh, these are vaccines. They're, they're not something that gets metabolized. Uh, but there is a little bit of detail here, and I'll go into what, what do we know about this. Uh, people who are on particular medications that are metabolized by the liver, so the hepatic cytochrome um, SIP450 system, um, we actually can see sometimes, and we think it's cytokine induced, right? You get your vaccine, there's that reactogenicity. Sometimes if anything, it can increase the metabolism of certain medications. Um, and we want to know about stuff like this, right? If like someone's on warfarin, okay, no interaction there. Some other medications, what actually is happening here, it's improving the metabolism. It's speeding up the metabolism of certain medications. Um, most of the studies in this area have not suggested that it's um, of significant or clinical relevance. But yeah, there, there is a little bit of a, a subtle issue here. But if you're a poor metabolizer, well, temporarily, you're going to be a slightly better metabolizer. Victoria writes, I'm the parent of a 13-year-old daughter who has Down syndrome. My family has been careful during the year, working and schooling from home, reducing our risk. But this has come at great cost to our 13-year-old schooling and social development because remote school has been pretty much miserable and ineffective for her. So my household awaits with great anticipation the news that we can have our daughter vaccinated when Pfizer is authorized. But I can't help wonder, will the vaccine be sufficiently effective for people with Down syndrome? Or is it likely that my family should expect that the vaccine will not offer our daughter substantial protection. I suspect there's scant empirical evidence, but what might you predict based on your knowledge of the immune system of folks with trisomy 21? Yeah, no, this this is a great question. Um, and, and we are starting to expand from just the, oh, how does this group of 30,000 people respond uh, to looking at some of these other populations? And we discussed the last time about people with transplant, people with other immune issues. Now, a couple of things I'm going to say. I'm going to say I am actually quite optimistic from what we know about these vaccines and what we know about the immune system uh, that an individual with Down syndrome will, will get excellent. I'm going to say excellent. An adolescent with with uh, Down syndrome should get excellent response. We saw in the trial uh, of adolescents, 100% protection against even a positive PCR test with Pfizer. And that's pretty amazing. Uh, let's say that you drop that down to 90%. That's still really um, impressive. And if it's not a negative PCR test, um, is it going to at least be should there be a positive PCR, it's lower level. Um, so I actually, I, I would optimistically say I would go ahead, I would get that vaccine. Um, the efficacy looks really impressive. So even if it's a little bit reduced in someone with Down syndrome because of the issues there, we have a lot of margin of reduction here. Mike in South Jersey writes, the day after receiving the second dose of Pfizer vaccine, I developed an irregular heartbeat. I have had symptoms the past six days which tend to be worse at rest. I have yet to determine if I also have myocarditis. After going to my primary care physician and cardiologist, I was surprised to learn that this is becoming more and more common. Can you please discuss this issue? Do you have any idea what might be causing it? I'm a 42-year-old male who exercises regularly and eats healthy. Yeah, so I think this is great. I want to try to put this in context. Um, you know, it Right now, we're getting to the point where what the majority of Americans have gotten, um, at least majority of adult Americans have gotten at least one dose of vaccine. Um, so it's almost like in the history of every patient, like when their vaccines were done. Um, you know, so it's it's pretty soon going to be uncommon that someone was not vaccinated. So do we see myocarditis? Yes. Do we see myocarditis at a higher rate in people that are vaccinated? I'm not sure that's true. Um, I was speaking to one of my cardiologist colleagues today about, you know, some basically things they're noticing. One was the issue, oh, this individual had low platelets, you know, and so in their mind, they had made a connection. Um, this is being actively looked into, uh, particularly with the Pfizer vaccine, for instance. You know, do people who get 
the Pfizer vaccine have a higher incidence of really anything, particularly uh, myocarditis, arrhythmias. Um, so far, we're not seeing that looking at the vaccine uh, reporting system, looking at all this robust tracking. Um, we still see what we see. People get vaccinated, they get bitten by dogs, they get bitten by cats, they get in car crashes, they have arrhythmias. Um, they Basically, all the things that we see, we still see. Um, and it's not clear that the myocarditis, the arrhythmias are actually at a higher level. So certainly that doctor will say, boy, of the last so many people I saw, 60% of them had been vaccinated. But you know what? 60% of all people have been vaccinated. So it's sort of tricky to actually, um, you know, look at what you're seeing and then really use a robust system to determine whether or not there's any causal link here. That is COVID-19 clinical update number 63 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone be safe. 